not too sleepy, don't eat too much, just right, just right. <laughs> it's hard, when there's so much good food, it's hard to kind of find the right balance, yeah? You have to really restrain. And this is the next topic, is about restraint, so this is good, good timing. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so we have uh, been looking at the Noble Eightfold Path, and we have seen kind of how the foundation of the whole path is the idea of right view coming from the Buddha. And then once you have the right view, then you ha get the right aim, the right purpose in life. Uh, and uh, that right, once you have the right purpose, you start living a moral life. So you have right action, you have right speech, uh, and you also have right livelihood. Right livelihood is also part of that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it anymore, but right livelihood is essentially about living so it is in accordance with right action. Yeah, you don't oppress other beings through your livelihood, and that is really what it is about. Uh, so, uh, s you know, there are some, s there are lots of uh, uh, work in this world that is really wonderful. Uh, someone told me, told me that she had two daughters who were both doctors. I thought, wow, that's really nice kind of livelihood. Yeah, both doctors, uh, or any kind of job like that, teachers and nurses and people who support others. Yeah, it's what a, these are all really wonderful livelihoods. Uh, but uh, one of the things to remember about whatever job it is you do, even if, you know, whatever it is, uh, uh, usually it has an aspect to it whereby you are helping other people. Uh, you know, even if you, even if you seemingly don't have a the job seem kind of ordinary, maybe you're working in the bank or something like that, uh, there's always customers, there's always co-workers. Uh, so if you have the right attitude to whatever job you have, uh, attitude of, you know, uh, helping your customers, helping your co-workers or whatever, uh, all of those can, you can kind of enhance your spiritual path just by thinking about your work in the right way. Uh. So it's all in the intention, what, how do we, what do we intend? And uh, w so uh, it's, you can make almost anything into something positive as long as you think about it in the right way. That's kind of the, the critical issue usually. Uh. So once you have all the moral factors into place, the kind of external morality, uh, then the next thing is to purify your mind. Uh, yeah. So we do one uh, coarse purification, then the more refined purification, and this is what happens with uh, right effort. So now we're going to look at the idea of right effort. And uh, so if we now, I'd like to go to page 85 uh, in the little booklet, uh, 85. And the sutta is called Sloping East, is the sutta. Hmm. And uh, this is the standard explanation of right effort in the suttas, and we have seen it already, but I'll just explain it in a little bit more detail perhaps, so you get some idea what is meant by this. Uh, this is from the... Uh, uh, the uh, Padana Sangyutta, is that what it's called? Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, the, uh, uh, this sutta goes as follows. Uh, it's the first sutta in the, uh, I think it's called the Padana Sangyutta, something like that. Is that right or something like that? Sama Padana Sangyutta, okay, thank you. So, at Savati. There the Buddha said, mendicants, there are these four right efforts. Uh, what for? It's when a mendicant generates enthusiasm, tries, makes an effort, uh, exerts the mind and strives to do, strive so that bad and wholesome qualities don't arise. Yeah, so this is the first one and here again you have this idea, this word enthusiasm that we came across before, uh, which is uh, chanda in Pali. Uh, uh, and uh, I think enthusiasm is a nice word because it doesn't have the sense of desire related to it. Even though the word chanda in Pali can be called desire, it's a wholesome kind of desire. So similar in many ways to enthusiasm. And then you have all these other words here which all have to do that you put in an effort uh, to avoid the unwholesome qualities. Uh. So this is all about, uh, you know, your you, you're kind of wandering around in your daily life or even in your meditation practice uh, and if you're not careful the unwholesome qualities can arise in the mind. So uh, uh, you have to have some kind of awareness uh, 
and then you kind of generate, you, you ensure that that awareness is in place, and then when you see that unwholesome qualities are about to arise, then you take the uh, another route and you find a way of avoiding those uh, unwholesome qualities. And this is what this is about. So it's about stopping bad things from happening. Uh, yeah, And this obviously is very advantageous if you can stop it before it ha it's happening. It means that you can maintain a fairly pure mind. So this is called the right effort of restraint usually, uh, because you stop things, bad things, from arising. Yeah. So this is uh, uh, the first one. All of these four kind of work uh, together. The second one is they generate enthusiasm, try, make an effort, exert the mind and strive so that bad unwholesome qualities that have already arisen uh, are given up. So sometimes your restraint does not work, so then you have to make an effort to overcome those um, bad qualities that arise. Uh, so the uh, 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 one of the things to be aware of here, it uses all this language that seems to re require a lot of effort, exert the mind, but uh, remember what we, when we looked at this other sutta, the Dveda Vitaka Sutta, etc., it actually says there that the effort, when you're making an effort, doesn't necessarily mean a lot of willpower. Often it just means turning the mind in the right direction, uh, using your wisdom, and then allowing the wisdom to overcome those unwholesome qualities. Uh, so often wisdom power is what it is about, rather than willpower. Uh, and it is far more effective, uh, and I might b talk about this in a second again, why it is more effective. Uh. So this is how you overcome the arisen unwholesome qualities. Uh, uh, you generate enthusiasm, try, make an effort, exert the mind and strive so that the good qualities, skillful qualities arise. Uh. So this is like when you are, you know, trying to, uh, in your meditation, you gently uh, nudge the mind a little bit to give rise to some positive feelings, uh, or you kind of look at your fellow fellows uh, in the spiritual life, and you, uh, you look at them with a kind of kindly eye, and you remember their good qualities, uh, yeah, and you remember the generosity among you, and all of these things. You, you give rise to these things, and then you fe can feel the good qualities inside of you arise as a consequence. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you, very often you see this happening. And then the last one is that once these wholesome qualities do arise, uh, then you have to uh, strive to maintain them so they don't get lost. Uh, so you generate enthusiasm, try, make an effort, exert the mind and strive so that the skillful qualities that have arisen remain, are not lost, but increase and mature and are completed by development. Uh, these are the four right efforts. So you, uh, in the last one, it's a bit like, you know, when you, uh, you learn how to give rise to good qualities, you keep on doing it, uh, and then you keep on doing it, and gradually these things become more and more powerful. This can be within your meditation practice, that you focus on an object uh, and then it kind of keeps on increasing the good qualities uh, or it can be more generally uh, the general qualities in daily life uh, whereby you become more generous or more mindful and more kind-hearted in daily life activities. Uh, so this, are, this is kind of throughout uh, uh, your practice, whatever it is that you're doing, these things are, are to be used. Uh, so you can see there that uh, it is all about reducing uh, and removing unwholesome qualities of mind uh, and giving rise to and improving the wholesome qualities of mind. This is what the whole path is about. Uh, this is what Buddhism is about. Uh, yeah, Because as long as you do that, uh, it means that you're heading in the direction of something very positive. Uh, yeah, you're moving in the right direction. You don't even have to worry about whether you're going to get jhanas or stream entry. Many people tell me that, oh, I'm aiming for stream enter this life. Uh, I think, okay, good, but don't think too much about that. Leave that at the back of your mind uh, and focus more on the practical, simple little things in daily life. Uh, how can I live? And then you judge uh, your progress simply by whether you are slowly growing in good qualities uh, and declining in bad ones. If you are, you're on the right track. Eventually, you will have no choice but to become a stream enter. Uh, even if you don't want to become one, you will become one, yeah? So, <laughs> cannot, there's no turning back anymore. Yeah. So this is the good thing, and it's, yeah. 
So that is uh, ha how, it, uh, how it works. Uh, so uh, now I would like to have a look at a little bit more of a concrete example. And this is a sutta from the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourse. This is the next one on page 86. It's called Restraint. And this is one of the suttas that give a very, um, a fairly detailed explanation of these four right efforts. Yeah? And every time you get a detailed explanation of what things are, of course you are missing, some things are missing out because a, a detailed explanation by nature has to focus on certain areas. So this may not be a complete explanation of what this is about, uh, but at least it gives you a, an idea of how these things can be put into practice in daily life. So the first one is the first of the four right efforts, yeah? The effort to restrain. So there are four altogether, and this is the effort to restrain, the effort to give up, the effort to develop, and the eff effort to preserve. These are exactly the four that we had a look at just a, a minute ago. Huh? And so then, what mendicants is the effort to restrain? So this is how restraint happens. And what we are coming to now is the standard formula for sense restraint in the suttas. And this is quite an important formula in the suttas because whenever you see the gradual training, the trainer that takes you all the way from the beginning all the way to awakening, uh, this is always part of that. Uh, this is one of the core ideas in the Buddhist practice, this idea of sense restraint. Uh, and it's um, important to get this right because, uh, as I mentioned the other day, the, uh, the word restraint has a very much a feeling of force to it. Uh, uh, but really, when it comes to this passage here, it actually doesn't mean that, or it doesn't always mean that. It may mean that perhaps occasionally, but very often it actually means something else. Uh, so let's have a look at this. Uh, when a mendicant sees a sight with the eyes, uh, they don't get caught up in the features and details. Uh, if the faculty of sight were left unrestrained, uh, bad, unwholesome qualities of desire and aversion would uh, become overwhelming here. Uh, for this reason, they practice restraint, protecting the faculty of sight uh, and achieving its restraint. So this is, uh, so here you, you see things, yeah, we can't, avoid, it's, it, we can't avoid seeing things, you see things all the time, there's, there's not a solution to go with your eyes closed all the time, that doesn't really work, uh, we have to see things. Uh, uh, so you see stuff, stuff comes into your head through your eyes uh, and uh, uh, then there is different ways of reacting to the things that we see here. And very often we can react with either we'd like something or we dislike it or a lot of the time we're kind of neutral, we don't really care, it's kind of not, not one or the other. Uh. So what it says here is that when you see something with the eye, uh, you don't get caught up in its features and details. Uh. And caught up here, the Pali word is gahi. And uh, uh, gahi means that you nimitta gahi anubhyanjana gahi. Gahi is like to grasp or to take hold of. Yeah? He translates it here as don't get caught up in her. So you don't grasp these features or details of what you are seeing here. And what does that mean, to grasp? And what it means is like your mind uh, sticks to them, the mind doesn't let go. So after you have seen something, yeah, this is about seeing specifically, uh, it's like your mind lingers on that thing. Uh, it doesn't just carry on and be mindful of what, what the next thing is, uh, but it lingers on that thing. Uh. And the lingering happens because of two reasons, uh, either because you like what you're seeing, in which case desire arises, yeah, so you kind of stay with that, uh, or because you have aversion, because you have negativity towards it. Uh, and uh, because you have negativity towards it, uh, uh, then also you linger. Okay, it's very, very good, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Jerry is kind of the uh, upatak. He runs around serving us drinks and coffees and everything. That's very, very nice. <laughs> so you have all of these, uh, so this is how you this is what is meant by grasping here, yeah, or by getting caught up in there. Is the sense that you either desire it or you have aversion towards it, and because of that, your mind doesn't let go. It doesn't move on to the next one. Yeah? And you will perhaps notice this in your meditation. Yeah, it's nice and peaceful, and suddenly some noise appears, uh, 
And then sometimes you may not like that noise. Yeah, and you think, oh, that noise, yeah. And then your mind is kind of stuck. You have grasped onto that noise. And then uh, because you have grasped onto it, the mind kind of gets stuck there. And you can't let go and just go back to the silence again. Uh, and you kind of think about it or something like that. Uh, yeah, so the idea is when you meditate, and this is the kind of the point here, is to get that distance between yourself and what, and what is happening around you. So when the noise comes, uh, you don't have any aversion to it regardless of what happens, uh, nor do you desire it, uh, if it is uh, very desirable or beautiful, you stand back and you allow it just to come. Uh, and because there is no reaction, as soon as the noise disappears, uh, you are back again with the, with the breath. You may be even with the breath when the uh, noise is there, it doesn't really disturb the mind at all, because you're just standing back, uh, watching things in the world. Uh, and uh, to be able to do that has to do uh, with right outlook. You have to look at the world in the right way. You have to know that noises are inevitable. You have to know that people sometimes are a little bit noisy. Uh, yeah, the people around you, uh, sometimes they do things. <laughs> and this is just the nature of people. Uh, and then you don't allow yourself to become upset. Uh, last one we had a baby yeah, crying and making noises throughout the whole, most of the meditation, which was kind of kind of nice, kind of sweet, but uh, a little bit disturbing, but nothing too much. You just let it be, okay? The baby kind of does a little bit of gurgling or whatever it is that it does, uh, and then you kind of, you allow that to be, and it's, you don't, there, is, there is no issue there. Uh, or even if some uh, hoons kind of uh, uh, do some kind of, uh, they, they rev up the cars a little bit in the street or whatever, it doesn't actually bother you that much. You allow, you know, this is the nature of people, especially young people, they got to drive the cars in kind of, noisy ways, because that's what young people like to do. And so, okay, fine. And you kind of carry on like that. Uh. But you can see it very easily in your meditation practice, how you get caught up in things. Uh, uh, because there, you have already have a degree of peace. Uh, you can see how this works. Uh. But of course, in daily life, it is also happening. Yeah, all the time, all the time it's happening. Uh, uh, but you can learn about the process uh, uh, as you, uh, in your meditation practice. Uh. So this is what we want to avoid. We want to have that flow, where the mind just flows through things, uh, because that is how you can maintain mindfulness. Uh, and then you can just be aware, and that is how you stop the greed, the, uh, the ill will, and then it becomes more and more peaceful because of that. Uh, soon as you get caught up, uh, you lose your peace, uh, and that then the meditation kind of halts. Uh, but if you're able to stand back, things tend to become more and more peaceful. Uh, your breath becomes more refined, and then you are on the way to this beautiful Anapanasati Sutta with all the 16 steps, and you kind of woof, off you go on the 16 steps. So you avoid the uh, grasp and getting caught up in the features and details. So these are just uh, maybe the whole, the whole sight that you see, or details of it, yeah, whatever it is. Uh, that's really all that means. Uh, uh, and because if you do leave it unrestrained, if you allow the, the world to pull your faculties in, uh, uh, yeah, then the, the, the qualities arise in your mind. You either desire it uh, or you have aversion to that object. You either like it or you dislike it. Uh, this is what it means. Uh, and then once you are caught up in that, then your mind is far from stillness. It's restless. It is... Um, uh, it, you lose the ability to just be mindful and be aware. And this is the problem that happens at that particular point. Uh, these unwholesome qualities arise, uh, and you lose your happiness as well. Yeah, this is really what, of course, why this is a problematic. Yeah. So for this reason, you practice restraint uh, of the uh, faculty of sight. You achieve restraint over it. Uh. So there's two things that you have to do here. First of all, you have to have the awareness. You have to know what is going on. Uh, and very often you can see that uh, something is happening which may be about to give you a little bit of desire or aversion. Yeah, you don't really want, want this or you want it a little bit too much or whatever. Uh, you can see that happening. So this is like the guarding. Yeah? It is the uh, mindfulness faculty which is aware of what is going on. Uh, so you guard, you see what is happening here. And this is kind of the initial thing that is required. You can only have sense restraint if you have a certain degree of mindfulness. So you have the mindfulness, and then, because you have the mindfulness and these things are happening, then when the desire and aversion arises, you have to know what to do. Yeah, if otherwise, if you don't know what to do, then it, it, it's not enough to have mindfulness, you have to have the instructions for what to do at this particular point. So what do we do when aversion arises? What is the right thing to do? And uh, it depends 
on the situation, it depends on the degree of aversion and desire. Sometimes we can, all we can do is just, we can just remain mindful if it is a weak thing and just allow it to pass and it's not a problem. Uh, yeah, if it's a very, only very small aversion or desire, it's not an issue, you stand back, you allow it to come and go and then it's gone. Uh. But sometimes it can be more strong uh, and it can really carry us away and we can kind of get caught in a stream of thought about all kinds of stuff. Uh. So sometimes you need something more than just observing it as it happens. Uh. And this is where those uh, uh, ideas or those uh, uh, things that I, that uh, other sutta we had a look at, the uh, overcoming of resentment sutta comes in. Resentment is often the most difficult thing in these things. Uh. So then you kind of bring those things into the picture. Yeah, you remind yourself uh, of actually all of these things that you're getting caught up in. They are so unsatisfactory and uninteresting anyway. Now I'm doing what really matters. I'm doing my meditation. If it is people that you are feeling resentful towards uh, or ill have maybe get some anger or ill will for uh, then you use the agata pativinaya sutta the overcoming of resentment reminding yourself of the good qualities of that person reminding yourself of the uh, you know being compassionate towards them you have to do it quite quickly because once it gets really uh, strong in your mind it can be too late uh, so you use that to overcome so you have those tools ready yeah at the back of your mind so when these things happen you know how to apply them uh. but a lot of the time all you have to do is just stand back and allow things to be here uh, and then the flow is there and then you, there is not not so much of a problem uh. so you need two things uh. you need the mindfulness uh, and you need the tools to be able to deal with problems when they arise uh. and this is true in meditation but is also true outside of meditation in daily life both of those situations uh, you can use these things uh. so wisdom power is the trick here it says restraint uh, you restrain the eye faculty uh, but you uh, try to use wisdom to overcome any ill will or negativity that arises uh. okay so uh, that is uh, restraint. Yeah, this is the very important part again of the gradual training. Uh, so you don't allow desire and aversion to overwhelm you because you have the right outlook, the right way of looking at the things of the world. Uh, so you enable yourself to kind of avoid these things. Uh. And this is how you restrain the eye faculty, you protect the eye faculty. And then it's exactly the same with all the other uh, senses, yeah, the sound, you hear a sound, you smell an odor uh, with the nose, uh, you taste a flavor with the tongue, uh, you feel a touch with the body, uh, or you even know something with the mind, yeah, the mind is also included here, so again, uh, you don't allow yourself to get caught up, you have some fantasy or something, and you see something nice in your mind, uh, and then exactly the same principle, uh, you don't allow yourself to be caught up, you are aware of what's happening in your mind, and this, of course, is the most difficult thing because the mind is very fast and things kind of flash before you. Before you know it, you are kind of heading down the wrong track. Uh, but uh, even there, if you have enough mindfulness, you will be able to see it when you're moving in an undesirable direction. Uh, and then you do exactly the same thing again. Uh, and then you avoid being caught up in these things. Uh. And um, it is not so hard to do. It is hard to do if you're going to do it uh, all the time with every kind of thought uh, but it's not so hard to do with the most uh, uh, coarse kind of uh, ill will and negativity especially uh, this is something everyone can do because we we tend to be aware when, when these things are arising uh, and as long as you inv uh, invest a little bit of effort into building up these tools uh, seeing the good side in other people having compassion for others and all of these things uh, you will be able to use this when uh, ill will or aversion arises in your mind uh, yeah quickly use it and bang it is gone uh. and this is a very uh, interesting and very uh, a very powerful way of dealing with defilements, far more powerful than restraint coming from willpower, uh, because wisdom power actually overcomes the defilement completely. Uh, we'll have a more of a look at this when we come to the next one of these, uh, these ones here. So that is the restraint. This is to avoid bad or unwholesome qualities arising. But what if they arise anyway? Restraint isn't going to be 100% successful if we can make it, you know, a little bit successful, that's good already. If you can make it 10%, great. And then if you can e increase the percentage over time, 
even better, but there's sometimes Mara is going to get the better of you. Huh? Yeah, and when Mara gains access, bang, suddenly you know that you have been caught up with these uh, uh, desires and aversions. And then you have, again, you have to deal with that. And this is the next one. Huh? And this is the one which is called uh, the right effort to give up. And what mendicants is the effort to give up? Uh, it is when a mendicant does not tolerate sensual, malicious, or cruel, or maybe, uh, maybe ruthless thoughts that arise. But you give those thoughts up, get rid of it, eliminate it, and obliterate it. <laughs> they don't tolerate any bad, unwholesome qualities that have arisen there. But give them up, get rid of them, eliminate them, and obliterate them. This is called the effort to give up. Now, ag again, like I mentioned to you before, when we had a look at the Dveda Vitaka Sutta during the previous part of the retreat, uh, um, uh, again, these words that are used here are very similar to the words used in the Dveda Vitaka Sutta. The idea, the words of eliminating and obliterating and giving up and all of this. Uh, and uh, so it might give you the impression that here, again, you have to use a lot of willpower. Uh, but as we saw in the Dveda Vitaki Sutta, the way to deal with these unwholesome thoughts uh, is actually not through willpower. The whole sutta is about how to use wisdom to overcome these things. Uh. Yeah, you remember the Buddha says that uh, you know, when these things arise, uh, then you remember that it, it, this is going to be for my own suffering. Uh. Yeah, affliction is a word used there. It will be for my own affliction, for the affliction of others, uh, and for the suffering of both. Uh. And when you, just by remembering that, uh, you actually let go of these things. Uh. So you have to really understand this in a deep way, uh, in such a deep way that uh, as soon as you kind of touch, as soon as you know it's there, oh, you don't want to go there because you know it's painful. Uh. It's that same similarly as the hot piece of coal that you pick up by accident. Ah, don't need to think for letting it go because you know it's going to be suffering, so let it go straight away. Uh. And this is exactly the same thing with these kind of things. Uh. You know the danger, you know it leads away from Nibbana, as it says there. You need it leads to the cessation of uh, uh, Panya, of, of wisdom, uh, and it also has uh, the um, Agatha, it is, leads to difficulties. Uh. So this is all you have to do, uh, yeah? understanding the problem uh, of these things. Uh, and as you understand that, using that wisdom, you let it go. Uh. And again, you have the same similes as I just mentioned a second ago about the uh, how to deal with difficult people, as also kind of wisdom, remembering their good qualities, uh, um, r having compassion for them, and again, you give up the anger and ill will in these ways. Uh. And uh, the, the reason why this is very useful is that if we try to restrain things through willpower, uh, again, when you use willpower, you're kind of holding things down, trying to suppress them, hold them in, in place. Uh. And very often, if you use that willpower, two things happen. Uh, you only have so much willpower, and after a while you can feel really tired, and when you feel tired, you know, everything just comes back again, because you can't sustain it any longer. And if you just hold it down, it tends to come back with a vengeance later on. Uh, uh, but if you use wisdom power, uh, if you see the problem with these things, uh, you actually eliminate them in a much deeper sense. Uh, because you know there's no point in holding on to what is suffering, because you know that, you actually let go properly. You don't just suppress, you don't just restrain, you don't hold it down with willpower, you actually let it go completely. Yeah. So wisdom power has uh, lots of benefits. Uh, it's a more profound sense of letting go. Uh, it doesn't deplete your energy so much, because you don't have to kind of use willpower. Uh, uh, the downside is that you need to reflect a little bit to be able to build up that wisdom uh, to enable you to use it when the time comes. Uh, and then it is obliterated, it is gone, the problem. Uh. So, uh, um, there you are. Uh, that is the overcoming of the unwholesome qualities. Uh. Does it make sense? Yeah? Okay, good. I'm glad it makes sense uh, because uh, that's what I'm sort of trying to, hoping it will, uh, hoping it will make sense. Uh, so, uh, but if you don't understand, please ask. So, that is the two uh, things about overcoming the unwholesome, uh, stopping it from arising, uh, and also once it has arisen, what, how to deal with it. Uh. And now we come to the other side of the coin, uh, and that is to how to develop the good qualities of the mind. Uh, yeah? 
and this obviously is uh, just as important. And uh, here the Buddha says, and what mendicants uh, is the effort to develop? It is when a mendicant develops the awakening factor of mindfulness, uh, the awakening factor of investigation of uh, principles, uh, the awakening factor of energy, the awakening factor of uh, joy or rapture, uh, the awakening factor of tranquility, uh, the awakening factor of samadhi, uh, the awakening factor of equanimity, uh, or evenness of mind perhaps, uh, which rely on seclusion, fading away and cessation, and ripen as letting go. This is called the effort to develop. So uh, here we are suddenly dealing with the awakening factors. Uh, yeah? And this is the very end of the path. This is all about mindfulness and how that goes to samadhi. And this is what I, men I mentioned la before. I mentioned the, I think, this uh, uh, idea that the effort is actually very broad in Buddhism. Uh, and sometimes it also overlaps with the other factors. And here we see how it overlaps with samasati and samasamadhi. And in one way, samasati, samasamadhi and samavayama, right effort, it's almost as if the three often go together like this, They're like a group of uh, phenomena, a group of factors that kind of work together in this way. Yeah. So we use right effort to guide us in the right way uh, to develop the samadhi and the sati. Yeah. And this is what we're seeing here. So when you are developing basically your meditation practice, this is what this is saying, yeah, you're sitting down watching the breath, uh, and when you are watching the breath in the right way, so it gives rise to these things, uh, then you are doing the, uh, uh, the, the development, the uh, effort of development, or whatever it is, uh, the effort to develop. Uh, yeah, that is what is happening. That's really all you have to do. So it's a very simple kind of effort. Uh, uh, and so remember that again, it said in the previous sutta, we just saw, it says that you have, uh, you, you use enthusiasm, you try, you make an effort, you exert your mind and you strive. But sometimes all you have to do is really sit back and watch the breath. Yeah, very simple, don't really do very much, do as little as possible and allow the whole thing to develop. And then you are doing all of those things, uh, the uh, putting forth the effort. So it's important to understand the idea of effort is very varied here. Uh, sometimes the right effort is just to stand back and watch and to be aware and not do very much at all. Uh, so uh, again, the, uh, a, a, a great variety of efforts uh, depending on exactly what it is that you are doing here. So that is the effort to develop. I think that's enough on that one. I'll just go to the last one. And what mendicants is the effort to preserve? Uh, it's when a mendicant preserves a meditation subject or object. Uh, that's a fine foundation for samadhi. Uh, the perception of a skeleton, uh, a worm-infested corpse, a livid corpse, a split open corpse, uh, or a bloated corpse. Uh, this is called the effort to preserve. Uh, these are the four efforts. Uh, so uh, if you want to get some samadhi, this is what you have to do, yeah? You have to get the corpse, corpse out and start observing the corpse. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, actually the corpse contemplation is actually a contemplation in, uh, of imagination. You don't actually have to see any corpse, you just have to kind of bring it up in your mind. Uh, and that's really good enough actually. Uh, so, uh, so that means that you don't have the, you don't have the smell at least, uh, because you just have it in your mind, that's kind of helpful. Uh, uh, so here, the idea of preservation is just that you are having some success in your meditation, yeah, and the meditation is going well, uh, and because it is going well, you preserve that, you keep on going, until eventually you reach uh, immersion. So very similar to the previous one, uh, uh, except that here, you, it is a little bit more preserving, you don't actually develop so much, whereas the previous one you develop. The two are very closely related to each other. It's very hard to kind of, uh, uh, to, to distinguish too much between them. Huh? Uh, it's a little bit strange that the skeleton and the corpse is used as the examples of uh, a meditation subject, uh, because uh, I think this is the only place in the suttas, apart from the Satipatthana, sang Satipatthana Sutta, where this is found. Uh, but um, there you are, there are many ways of developing the uh, immersion, the samadhi, uh, 
Uh, the breath would per perhaps have been a more natural one because the breath is used everywhere for this. Uh, so you could substitute with the breath, you can put that in there if you like. Uh, so any one of these subjects that lead to samadhi is, uh, is really what is meant here. Huh? So that is the four right efforts. Yeah, it encompasses pretty much everything. Yeah? And uh, this is a little bit limited because it kind of ties it down to specific things. Uh, but really, any time you develop a good quality uh, and you reduce a bad quality, you are practicing the four right efforts. So it's a very broad uh, and very large part of uh, what meditation is about and the Buddhist path is about. Uh. So. Uh, then, as you do this, uh, as you purify your mind through the four right efforts, uh, you reduce your ill will and perhaps you even reduce your desire for worldly things a little bit because you realize the limitations of the worldly things. Uh, as you do that, there comes a point when your mind is quite mindful. Yeah, especially when you go on the meditation retreat, you feel your mind is quite stable. Uh, it isn't being draw pulled around by aversion and desire so much anymore. And at that point, you come to Samma Sati, the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, there are still some defilements in the mind, but they're quite subtle at this point. Uh, yeah? You have taken away the coarse uh, defilements that pull you around and you're fairly present uh, in the present moment uh, and the mind is fairly stable uh, with samasati. That is the right time to move on to the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path uh, and start the Satipatthana practice. Uh, it's important to get this sequence roughly right uh, because again if you don't get it right uh, then you'll be doing one thing when you should be doing something else. Uh, yeah, you try to watch the breath, well actually what you really should do is overcome some of those defilements first of all because they're going to stop you. Uh, or you start uh, watching the breath and you're ha not even keeping the five precepts yet and that kind of stuff. Yeah? So get these things in the right order, otherwise uh, it will not work properly. Yeah. So now, what I will do now is to have a look at some of the suttas that have to do with uh, uh, Samma Sati. This is going to be a few of them from the, uh, the Satipatthana Sangyutta and also uh, a short extract from the Diga Nikaya 16 uh, which shows you a kind of the purpose of uh, Satipatthana and meditation practice. So, uh, let us start off with this uh, uh, short extract from the Diga Nikaya 16, the Maha Parnibbana Sutta, that gives a context for, for all of this. So this is the four applications of mindfulness. Four applications of mindfulness. Okay, that's probably my, probably my writing. I was, yeah, it must be mine because uh, that's not what Ajahn Sudhartha calls it. Uh. Okay, so uh, you don't know who has written these things. Eh? You just get the book and you have no idea who it comes from. Eh? <laughs> so <laughs> some of it is from Ajahn Sudhartha, a little bit is from me. Occasionally I made a mistake and put I.B. Horner's translation in there. So you get a bit of a mishmash, uh, which is kind of in makes it interesting for you. Eh? So you can have a kind of a game later on guessing who translated this particular sutta. <laughs> okay, so uh, Diga Nikaya 16, uh, a short little extract, uh, and this is as the Buddha is coming very close uh, to the end of his life. He has almost died during the rains retreat in Vesali, uh, and he has had deliberately to keep his life going uh, so that he didn't pass away at that particular time. Uh. So this is this point, and this is what he is saying to Venerable Ananda. He's telling him that I'm advanced in years and have reached the final stage of life. I'm currently 80 years old. Yeah, I have reached the final stage of life. There's nothing there about I could live on for an eon, as you can see. Uh, just as a decrepit cart keeps going by relying on straps, in the same way the realized one's body keeps going uh, by relying on straps, or so you'd think. In other words, uh, just as if it is relying on straps. Yeah, it's kind of uh, falling apart a little bit. Uh. Sometimes the realized one, uh, not focusing on any signs, uh, and with a cessation of certain feelings, uh, enters and remains in the signless samadhi, uh, cheto samadhi, samadhi of the heart. Uh. This is a special kind of samadhi um, that uh, you can enter. This uh, the animita samadhi, it's called in Pali. Only then does the realized one's body uh, become more comfortable. Uh. Yeah, you have to enter a samadhi state to be comfortable, so he's obviously getting old and worn out. Uh. So, Ananda, be your own island, your own refuge, with no other refuge. 
Let the teaching be your island and your refuge. We know other refuge. Yeah, so this is this famous saying of the Buddha that he says, don't have any other refuge in the world except yourself and the teachings of the Buddha. Yeah, all other things. The, uh, the Ananda has just complained, oh, you know, you are, you, I, I was really scared and worried when these things happened. Uh, and the Buddha says, well, what, what do you expect? All things that are dear and agreeable to you, it's not exactly here, but it's somewhere else in the same sutta. All thi uh, things that are dear and agreeable to you will become otherwise. Uh, you know, don't hold on, don't attach to things that are going to become otherwise. Uh, and this is why he's now saying, being an island unto yourself. Uh, have the Dhamma as your island. Uh, why? Because all these external things in the world are inherently unreliable, uncontrollable. They're going to change. Uh, there's only one way of having a sense of refuge. Uh, you have to find it within yourself. Uh, you have to be your own refuge. Uh, use the Dhamma as the refuge. Then there is a sense of finding a solution to the problems of life and the problems of the world. Uh, so it's very it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very nice message and it makes so much sense when you think about it. It's so easy to understand. Everything in the sensory world is inherently unreliable. It's going to let you down, it's going to be problematic. You have to find the refuge within. It's the only place where you have some degree of c control, if you like. You can, uh, you can do something with your own inner life by develop, developing it in the right way, but the external world is completely out of control. It is problematic. Yeah. So how do we do that? How do we be a refuge unto ourselves? And this is the next thing the Buddha talks about. This is why I brought this up at this point. Uh, how does a mendicant do this? Uh, it's when a mendicant meditates by observing an aspect of the body. Keen, aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. Uh, the four satipatthanas. Yeah, this is the standard description of the four satipatthanas. Uh, they meditate observing an aspect of feeling, of mind, of principles, keen, aware and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. That's how a mendicant is their own island, their own refuge with no other refuge. Why is that? Because here you go within. You go to the breath, you look within yourself, uh, instead of actually being interested in worldly phenomena, you actually let the world go, uh, and you go to your inner home inside. Uh. And one of those beautiful little sayings by Ajahn Shah that I also mentioned before, uh, the r our real home, the real home is within you, uh, because that is where you find precisely a refuge from these incredibly unsatisfactory external phenomena. And you can imagine when you are able to let go of the world, uh, and you know this to some extent already, when you have a little bit of peace in your meditation, uh, you feel like you're within yourself, you feel, it feels kind of uh, safe, and not only does it feel safe, it actually feels also very joyous and happy when you get it right. Uh, it feels really, it's a very positive feeling uh, to be within yourself in this way. You're watching the breath, uh, all you have in the world is, is, is the you and the breath together, uh, and actually it is one of the best things that can happen to you. Uh, who would have thought that just hanging out with the breath was going to be so nice? Uh, who needs that BMW or whatever it is? No need for those things, yeah? Breath is much better than the BMW. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a nice comparison. Yeah, comparing the breath to a BMW. Uh, nobody has done that before. So, <laughs> the breath is better than kind of these fancy cars. F chuck those fancy cars out. Get the breath in instead. Uh, this, is what the, this is what the Buddha is saying here. It, it, is actually, it is pretty much what he's saying, yeah, except that, yes, all of those external things. So you find that refuge within, so peaceful, uh, so beautiful, so happy, so contented, so delighted with just staying within. Uh, yeah, and what, a, what an amazing thing that is. It is so simple. The simplest things in the universe are far more attractive uh, than all these complications outside. Uh, and suddenly you know that you have found your true refuge. Uh, and this is why the Buddha is advising us to do this, uh, precisely because this is uh, uh, far more sustainable. Uh, and of course, that development of the mind that you are doing in this way is also what you then take with you as you pass on into the future. Whereas that, that, that BMW, it goes to your children, yeah? That, you can't take that with you, that is kind of left behind, uh, and that is the problem. Uh. I say BMW all the time because I was once, I was driven with this in Perth, we have one of the supporters was driving me home, and this fellow had this incredibly fancy BMW, uh, so he whacked me in and I looked around and thought, wow, <laughs> 
So that's why I kind of say BMW, but it could be any fancy thing that we own yeah, in, in the world. Uh, but um, <laughs> so uh, that is where we find our refuge. And it's such a, it, when you, the more you think about it, it's actually very obvious. It's just that the problem of creating the refuge within, it takes commitment and it takes uh, perseverance. Uh, but as you do, you actually gradually, you do create that refuge within. Every time you do an act of kindness, every time you do an act of morality, every time you do something positive in this world, you are actually building up that inner refuge. Uh, and you are creating the cause and conditions eventually to be able to uh, go into much deeper meditation as well. All of these th things come together. Uh. So it, this is kind of the right view coming together with the uh, samadhi coming together with the satipatthanas, everything kind of uh, falling into place. Uh. Um, that's how the teaching uh, is the island and the island, uh, the refuge, uh, we know of the refuge. Uh. You're using the teaching of satipatthana to guide you as you do this. Uh. Whether now or after I have passed away, uh, any who shall live as their own island, as their own refuge, uh, with no other refuge, with the teaching as their island, and as their refuge, with no other refuge, uh, those mendicants of mine who want to train shall, shall be among the best of the best. Uh, sounds good, doesn't it? Uh, the best of the best. Uh, no more messing around, really, just getting in there. Uh. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, one of these uh, really nice little teachings that show you uh, the purpose one of the great purposes of Satipatthana, first of all, just to find refuge from a world that is inherently unreliable. And of course, eventually it goes well beyond that. It goes beyond to the ending and cessation of everything. But that is kind of the starting point. And that's pretty good already, isn't it? It's already a, a really nice place to begin. So, um, having looked at that sutta, I'm going to move on to the next one. Uh, uh, this sutta is called A Monk and uh, uh, it goes as follows. I'm not even sure why I have, why I have picked some of these suttas, I can't remember anymore, so it will be exciting for me to read this one and see what happens when we, <laughs> when we have a look at this. Uh. <laughs> So, at one time the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's monastery. Here. Then a mendicant went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side and said to him, Sir, may the Buddha please teach me the Dhamma in brief. When I've heard it, I will live alone, withdrawn, diligent, keen and resolute. <laughs> so this is how monks and nuns of, would sometimes go to the Buddha and say, please give me teaching so I can kind of become an arahant. That's kind of the idea. <laughs> That's kind of the purpose of this. And then the Buddha replies, this is exactly how some foolish people ask me for something. But, <laughs> but when the teaching has been explained, they think only of following me around. It's kind of interesting. Following the Buddha around is the wrong way. You're supposed to live in seclusion, live by yourself. Uh, yeah, not supposed to have these large gatherings. You're supposed to be uh, staying in seclusion as much as possible. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> and then uh, this monk says, or maybe none, Sir, may the Buddha teach me the Dhamma in brief. Please, please teach me. That's what he's saying here. Yeah, may the holy, may the holy one teach me the Dhamma in brief. Hopefully, I can understand the meaning of what the Buddha says. Hopefully, I can become an heir of the Buddha's teaching. Yeah. So maybe the Buddha says this to kind of stir up a little bit of a kind of a, you know urgency in this monk. Maybe he has been a bit too slack. So the Buddha said, "Okay, you know, don't be careful." And then he kind of the monk, this monk, is starting to get a bit worried. So then he listens more carefully. And of course, this is one of those things: is to get people to listen can often be the hardest part. And so the Buddha uses some skillful means. And then he says, well then, mendicant, you should purify the starting point in wholesome or skillful qualities. What is the starting point of skillful qualities? Well purified ethics and correct view. When your ethics are well purified and your view is correct, then you should develop the four kinds of mindfulness meditation. So, uh, 
And now I know why I picked the sutta. The reason I picked it was simply just to point out again the importance the mindfulness meditation, Satipatthana, is always said in the suttas to be based on two things, on morality, sila, yeah, on the one hand, and on the other hand, on right view. And this is why he says here, what does he say again? Correct view. This is the ujjukaditi, straight view, yeah, is the Pali word for this. So these two things are required for you to be able to practice the, the Satipatthana well. Yeah, sila, is required because you want to feel good about yourself. You want to go into the meditation, not be too concerned about ill will and desires dragging you this way and that way. So this is obviously very important, and I've already looked at this in qu quite a bit. So sila is required. The better your sila, the better your meditation is going. And ujjukaditi, uh, the reason why straight view is important, of course, is that you prioritize the meditation over other things. Uh, you understand that all these other things are actually not really all that meaningful in the long run. Uh, yeah, they don't really give you that satisfaction, the contentment that is important in life, uh, whereas meditation and a spiritual path does. Uh, so you're not really interested in those things. One of the biggest hindrances in meditation practice uh, is not uh, is that we are actually interested in all this other stuff. Uh, that is why the mind goes out of these things. Uh, why do we think about, you know, all the things in our life? Because they are important to us. Uh, and of course, to some extent, they are going to be important to you, but you want to lessen their importance a little bit, uh, get things in the right order, get the spiritual life on top, uh, and then these other things don't no longer distract you so much in your meditation practice. Uh, so this is right view, remembering what matters. And this is, again, why the Buddha says all of these things like, all that is dear and pleasing to you must become otherwise. Uh, okay, if that's true, maybe I should focus more on other things instead uh, and get the priorities in the right order. Uh. And just again, to make it absolutely clear, this does not mean that one neglects one worldly things, one doesn't neglect one's family or anything like that. Uh, it rather, one just remembers that uh, what should be prioritized. Uh, and usually when you prioritize your spiritual life, uh, actually uh, the rest of your life also actually turns out to be better because you become a more kind, more caring, more compassionate, more understanding person. You have more time for the people around you. Uh, and because of all of that, it actually, everything gets better. Uh, yeah, everything I I is improved as a consequence. Uh, it's a bit like, you know, sometimes my parents say to me, oh, I want to see you more often. But I tell them, actually, quality, much more important than quantity, yeah? So you don't, may not see me so often, but actually you get more quality out of me. I can act I've actually got something useful to say now. I didn't have anything useful to say before, but now I've got something useful to say here. Yeah. And they say, hmm, yeah, maybe you have a point. Okay, so then, then, then it's okay here. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, kind of how things work out. Uh. So um, that is that little sutta on uh, uh, the foundations of the uh, Satipatthana practice. Let's have a quick look at the next sutta as well. This next sutta is also uh, quite nice. This is the Cook's, Cook's Sutta. And uh, so, uh, Sutta Sutta, exactly, uh, the Cook. And uh, it goes as follows. Uh, Mendicant, suppose a foolish, incompetent and unskillful cook was to serve a ruler or the minister with an excessive variety of curries. Uh, superbly sour, bitter, pungent and sweet, hot, mild, salty and bland. But that cook didn't, didn't take their master's hint. Today my master preferred this also, or he reached for it, or he took a lot of it, or he praised it. Today my master preferred the sour, or bitter, or pungent, or sweet, or hot, or mild, or salty sauce, or he preferred the bland sauce, or he, pref or he reached for the bland one, or he took a lot of it, or he praised it. He did not take the master's hint. Yeah, this is kind of, so he went wrong, this cook, he didn't really, he didn't observe properly. Huh? That foolish, incompetent, unskillful cook does not get presented with clothes, wages, or bonuses. Why is that? Because uh, they don't take their master's hint. Uh, yeah, so you, if you're going to be a good cook, you've got to look at what the master is eating. And then when you look at what the master is eating, the master will give you a bonus afterwards. Uh, yeah, give you extra money, and then you, are, you become a happy cook. 
In the same way, so that this is what happens in meditation, in the same way a foolish, incompetent, unskillful mendicant meditates by observing an aspect of the body, keen, aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. As they meditate observing an aspect of the body, their mind does not enter immersion, does not come to samadhi, and their corruptions are not given up. Uh, this corruption is here refers to defilements of the mind, uh, so temporary defilements. Yeah, uh, upakilesa. This just refers to the five hindrances, really. Uh, the, the hindrances are not abandoned, uh, but they don't they don't take the hint. Uh, yeah, they meditate, observing all these other things, uh, and still they don't enter immersion, and the corruptions, the defilements are not given up. Uh, they don't get the hint uh, as to what to do, in the same way as that unskillful cook. So, uh, uh, that is how you are an unskillful meditator. Ooh, it's going to be... <laughs> so this unskillful meditator is the one who uses satipatthana, does not enter samadhi uh, from entering satipatthana. That foolish, incompetent, unskillful mendicant does not get blissful meditations in this very life, nor do they get mindfulness or clear comprehension, situational awareness. Why is that? Because they don't take their mind's hint. Suppose an astute, competent, skillful cook was to serve a ruler or the minister with an excessive variety of curries, superbly sour, bitter, pungent and sweet, hot and mild, salty and bland. And that cook took their master's hint. Today my master preferred this sauce, or he reached, reached for it, or he took a lot, lot of it, or he praised it. Today my master preferred the sour, or the bitter, or the pungent, or the sweet, or the hot, or the mild, or the salty sauce. Or he preferred the bland sauce, or he reached for the bland one, or he took a lot of it, or he praised it. Thus the astute, competent, skillful cook gets presented with clothes, wages and bonuses. Why is that? Because they take their master's hint. In the same way, the astute, competent, skillful mendicant meditates by observing an aspect of the body, keen, aware and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. As they meditate, observing an aspect of the body, their mind enters samadhi. Their defilements, their upakilesas, their five hindrances are given up. They do take the hint. They meditate observing an aspect of feelings, of the mind, or principles. And again, as they do that, uh, uh, their mind enters samadhi and their five hindrances, their defilements are given up temporarily. They do take the hint. That astute, competent, skillful mendicant gets blissful meditation in this very life uh, and they get mindfulness and clear comprehension. Why is that? Because they take their mind's hint. So, this is here shows the purpose of, uh, of Satipatthana practice. Yeah, this is kind of the point of this. Uh, and uh, the purpose of Satipatthana practice, if you do it in the right way, is to gain samadhi. Yeah, this is what happens when you do that. Uh, and um, not only do you gain samadhi, but what it says at the very end there, you also gain sati sampajanya. You gain clarity about things. And of course, that sati sampajanya that you have as you come out after samadhi, that is the kind of sati that is useful for. Uh, for insight and for destroying all the defilements and then to make you a stream enter and also eventually to make you an arahant. So, and this is uh, uh, something that you see throughout the suttas, uh, this idea that the purpose of Satipatthana practice is to give, you, give rise to uh, jhana states, samadhi, yeah, and giving up the defilements and then to give you the foundation for ins real insight practice after uh, you have attained the samadhi. Yeah. And this is uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to point this out, because uh, you find this in a number of places in the suttas, and uh, it, it is an important point to uh, keep in mind wha why we are doing this. Uh, and of course, as we come to the very end of the Noble Eightfold Path, which we are now, uh, this is the seventh factor. The factor after that is Samma Samadhi, yeah? 
Then the seventh factor leads on to the eighth factor, to Sama Samadhi. Sama Sati becomes the foundation for Sama Samadhi. And this is what this shows right there. Yeah. So I'm not going to say anything more about that. So uh, let's have a break and then come back again in about 20 minutes or so. Yeah.